Hey everybody, this video is going to discuss the information found toward the end of chapter two, so sections 2.4, 2.5 basically, um, deals with some different types of chemical reactions, uh, some different types of changes that can occur um, in substances, and most importantly, enzymes. So we just got done learning about a whole lot of different types of organic molecules and hopefully you remember that enzymes are almost always proteins that speed up chemical reactions. And so we're going to get into how they do that. You could argue that without enzymes, life couldn't exist. So we definitely want to understand what they do and how they do it. So time to share. <clears throat> Right. So here are our notes. And like I mentioned, we're going to talk about some changes that can occur in substances, uh, two types of chemical reactions, exergonic and endergonic. And then, of course, the main course, enzymes. So first of all, realize that matter can exist in basically three states, um, solids, liquids, gases. Typically, as you go here from left to right, you're adding energy, and as you go from right to left, going from a gas to a liquid, liquid to, liquid to a solid, uh, energy is being released by that uh, change. Physical changes, again, I, I chose these pictures, I think that's, they, they say it all. When, when ice melts, it's still the same substance. Its chemical identity hasn't changed. <clears throat> solid water is now liquid water. If I were to boil water and turn it into gaseous water, steam, still a physical change because it's still water. Uh, the piece of paper, you know, I crumpled it up. So it was a piece of paper before. It's still a piece of paper after. It's just different appearance more than anything else. Chemical changes, however, uh, this is when you are breaking bonds and reforming new bonds. You are changing the chemical identity of the substance. So, you know, a typical way that happens is through heating. You know, the, the proteins in the egg white are kind of gooey and clear to begin with. When we heat them, they link together in new ways to form this semi-solid uh, white opaque sub uh, form. <clears throat> chemical changes. So a chemical reaction in general, you've got reactants on the left of the arrow, products on the right of the arrow. We pronounce the arrow yields. So I could have, you know, any reactants over here. So let's just, I'm making stuff up, CO2 plus water, <clears throat> they'd be my reactants, yield the products, uh, glucose and oxygen or something like that. So chemical reactions basically start with reactants, you wind up with products. Typically reactions will go till they reach equilibrium. Uh, again, in chemistry, you'll talk way more about chemical reactions than in bio. But two types of chemical reactions, and it has everything to do with energy. So exergonic reactions give off energy. Energy is released or energy exits the chemical reaction. So exergonic energy exits. Endergonic reactions absorb energy. You have to supply them with energy to form the products. And so endergonic energy enters the reaction. Now this gonic part of the word refers to energy in general. So you might see exothermic or endothermic and the prefixes work the same way. Exo, energy is exiting, endo, it's, it's entering. Um, but when it's thermic at the end, it refers specifically to heat energy. But energy can occur in many different forms, light and sound and things like that. So exergonic and endergonic are, are more generalized terms. So let's take a look at these graphs. They're set up the same, where free energy is on the y-axis, uh, and basically time is on the x. You know, it's, it's, it's as the reaction progresses from left to right. So in this top case, you've got reactants that start out with this much energy and wind up with this much energy. So the products have less energy than the reactants. Well, there's a little thing called the conservation of energy, which says energy can't be created or destroyed in a closed system. So this energy has to be accounted for and it's given off as free energy to the environment. 
So that exact difference between the products and reactants, that difference in energy is exactly the amount of energy given off. And since energy is exiting or being released by this reaction, it's an exergonic reaction graph. On the flip side down here, we have reactants that only have this much energy to start and products that wind up somehow magically with this much energy. So that difference in energy has to be supplied by something from somewhere. And so that's exactly the amount of energy that has to be input into this reaction to form those products. And so since energy is entering, this is an endergonic reaction graph. Now, uh, there's a couple demos I'm going to show you of, of this too. Uh, but for now, this, this is sort of the, uh, the nuts and bolts of, of what these two reaction types are. Now, there's a little something called the activation energy. This is the energy that has to be supplied to a reaction in order to break the initial bonds, get the reaction going, and allow the reactants to reform new bonds in a new way to then become the products. So there's a graph that I want to show you in just a second where it'll make this a lot more clear. But again, just definitionally, the activation energy is the energy required to activate or get the reaction started. So here's what I mean. Same type of graph as before, but there's this, there's this hump here. I mean, in your head, say to yourself, what type of reaction is this, exergonic or endergonic? I'll give you a moment. Well, the reactants have this much energy. The products only have this much energy. So overall, energy must have been released, right? Because there's a drop in energy as the reaction progresses. So this is an exergonic chemical reaction, but the other graph didn't have this hump. So what's up with the hump? Well, the hump is the activation energy. It's, it's the amount of energy that you have to input at the beginning and once you break the initial bonds of the reactants, they're going to zoom. They're going to form those products. And in the process, they're going to give off not only this activation energy, but from this line down to the product line, that amount of energy overall as well. So you'll get your activation energy back. And then since it's exergonic, additional energy will, energy will be released. Now, we've got to talk about catalysts because enzymes are biological catalysts. Enzymes are catalysts inside cells. And what catalysts do is they speed up chemical reactions by lowering the activation energy. So in other words, this mountain of energy that normally has to be overcome, it's a big hurdle. And so this reaction might not happen on its own very readily. But in the presence of a catalyst, the dotted line, it turned that mountain into a speed bump of energy. So if it takes less activation energy to start the reaction, it's going to happen more readily, more faster. And notice you still go from reactants to products, right? Your energy begin and your energy end is still the same difference. What the catalyst does is it lowers the activation energy required to get it started, thus overall speeding up the chemical reaction. So again, enzymes are biological catalysts. They're almost always proteins, and they speed up reactions. We couldn't live without them. <clears throat> One of the characteristics of living things is to maintain homeostasis, to respond to stimuli. And without enzymes, we wouldn't be able to react to things quick enough, and we wouldn't be able to maintain homeostasis. I said, you could argue life wouldn't exist without enzymes. So we said enzymes are almost always proteins, and I'll explain later in the course why I say almost always. Turns out some RNA molecules can act as enzymes as well. We call those ribozymes, but that's a story for another day. Enzymes are reusable. That means they don't become part of the products. They, they can be reused over and over under the right conditions, theoretically forever. Enzymes are incredibly specific. In other words, one enzyme will only speed up one type of reaction and have no effect on any other, usually. And the lock and key analogy is often used. So only one key can fit a lock. Well, only one enzyme can speed up a particular reaction, maybe. And at this last bullet here, 
Can't emphasize this enough. This is the most important phrase when it comes to enzymes. They speed up chemical reactions by lowering that hump of activation energy. That's how they speed them up. So I wanna show you this little graphic. The blue thing represents an enzyme. Now it way oversimplifies it. Enzymes are chains of amino acids because again, they're almost always proteins. They have this incredibly complex globular 3D shape to them because the chain of amino acids bends and folds and twists uh, and takes on a very, very complicated, complex structure. So the active site is the part of the enzyme that the reactants or substrates fit into like a lock and key, but it's even way more specific than a lock and a key because of how unbelievably complex the shape of this molecule is. So when we say enzymes are very specific, only one substrate typically can fit into the active site. Once it's there, what happens is the bonds stress is relieved. The initial bonds can easily be broken. The new bonds can reform, turn into products, which then get released. Notice the enzyme is exactly how it started. So enzymes are reusable. This enzyme is ready to accept another substrate into its active site and it'll do the same thing. Now you can stop an enzyme from working by changing its shape. Just like if I were to file the nubs off a key, that key wouldn't work the lock anymore. Well, if I change the temperature or the pH of the solution, the enzyme's shape will change. And so if it changes just a little, maybe the substrate doesn't fit in quite as well and it doesn't speed the reaction up quite as much. If I change the shape of the enzyme enough, it won't work at all. And at that point, we'd say that the enzyme has been denatured, okay, by changing the temperature or the pH. Enzymes work best. They have an optimum temperature and an optimum pH they work best at, and that's because that's the temperature and pH that their shape is perfect in or at to catalyze the reaction. Okay, so again, enzymes, we will talk about them more as we go through some other topics uh, in the course, but super important, super specific, speed up chemical reactions, make life possible. All right, guys, if you have any questions, as always, please let me know. Back to the home screen, and uh, I will see you next video.